there we are <laughs> how lovely to see you it's been four years you know has it four years like we've obviously spoken but this has been the first time we've seen each other's faces in real time in four years slam dunk 2017 was the last time when i was dressed in my sailor hat and we were, <laughs> we were having a cigarette outside the dressing room complex area um i think that was the last time wow you know it's strange i feel like um time moved in a strange way for like the past six or seven years um and now all of a sudden time is moving in a totally different way uh in these plague days um but that's been too long man that's that's far too long you know um well i want to say thank you first of all for the lovely quote that you gave me for my book um i feel like the last few times we have spoken has just been me harassing you for stuff for favors um <laughs> so thank you for making me sound good uh and and yeah the the response that i've had from the people who are in that book has been really validating and really inspiring and uh yeah it's that's been the one thing i think that's kept me kind of well not the only thing but the main thing that's kept me sane over the last 12 months is the you know the the getting to work and doing that sorry let me turn that off um and then the the response from I mean, the response from people who bought it has been lovely, but the response from people who've been in it and even just that you read it means a lot as well. Well, congratulations, Matt. And and it's interesting, like it, it feels like that um uh writing books or putting out books uh is still uniquely satisfying in the pandemic times in a way that being a musician isn't. Um, but that that says something unique about books is that, you know. Like being a musician, similar to a writer, you, you go through these periods of time of gestation where you're like working on something and you're isolated, you know, you're in your zone, your home office, whatever. Um, and then it all culminates to this thing and you release it to the world, you know. Um, and for a musician, then there's the payoff of getting up on stage in front of an audience and you have this really physical thing. But for a writer, it's just... And then you move on to the next book. <laughs> you know, there is no performance aspect of it where suddenly it's an aerobic exercise. It's just all that um, that isolation and monotony, which is perfect for pandemic times, right? It's kind of a come down. Let me ask you this. So your book um, was obviously the stakes were way higher. You know, like I went through a certain level of self-discovery and uncovering um, more to do with, I think, just where my life was at in the the times of the conversations in which i was transcribing so it wasn't like a direct thing but obviously with your book completely confessional and and then when you finish it and it's out there in the world as you say the response was incredible the reviews were incredible but you don't really see firsthand the impact that it's had like in the way that you would with your songs but with a process such as your book and specifically what you were exploring i, I imagine people would think oh because it's now out there on the table that's the end of that journey like it's complete you're whole now because you've got it off your chest but actually that's just the start of the next stage right well yes yes but but it's interesting in that way like as you were talking about that i was thinking about that how um uh you know you you get that i i, I was wondering if you 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 got that when you finished your book where like it's hard oftentimes when you put out a record to immediately turn around and talk about it in the press because you don't understand what it is that you've just made. And like with putting together a book, which, you know, similar to like, but for both of us, you know, going back through and sorting through old material, thinking about a past period of time in your life or a conversation or something with that amount of time between you and then like you understand it differently and then put together as a whole, you understand it differently. So it's like easier to talk about and then easier to look at as a, that was a period of time. This is a thing. Now I'm moving on. We're oftentimes with the record. It's just too fresh. And, I, you know, you're put to task to explain something that you can't explain yourself. But um, but but yeah, I mean, there is a challenge in that. And I guess that's like a, a champagne problem or whatever of putting out a memoir specifically at like a fairly young age, 36. Like I, I was 36 years old when the book came out of that, you know, um, most rock and roll memoirs specifically, I feel like are done more when people are in their 60s or something like that. You know, it's like a complete career wrap up. And then the challenge for me has been. And now you have to keep living, you know, and yeah, that's, uh, keep that's writing what I was sort of story, hinting at, you know? I guess, was yeah. did you find that like there was a sense of, well, yeah, now 
obviously I have to keep going and I'm, you know, I'm not just going out to pasture. Um, where did you go? I mean, I know we're kind of going back a what it's again, four years. So the last time we properly spoke and sat down and did one of these was just after the book had come out. So I guess really I'd love to catch up on <laughs> not just the pandemic times and what have you been doing during lockdown, but really the last four years um, for you personally, obviously we can talk about America to some extent and you know, what's been going on there as well. But the last four years have been quite, I mean the last year. Yeah. But the last four years have been quite the trip. Yeah. A hundred percent. It seems like it could have been 10 years. Uh, but um, what have I been up to? That's Were you in a good place in your life when you released the book, when you'd gotten a lot of that heavy stuff off your chest and you know, you'd had such an amazing response to the book? Was it a, was it a gratifying experience releasing it? And then in the, the months that immediately followed the book, because you'd exposed yourself so vulnerably and wholly, what was, if you can remember, the headspace that you were in in the months that you know immediately preceded the release of Trump? For, for me, it was debilitating. Like it broke me down so mentally and emotionally, but that was part of the process of the book. You know, it was really like if you're going to take a really close examination of yourself, you're going to have to really break yourself down and be really honest uh, about stuff. So finishing it, I just felt like, you know, a dish rag that had been wrung out just completely. Um, and then, you know, the book came out, I think it was on November 16th, if I remember correctly. And my birthday was November 8th. I turned 36 years old and that was the day Trump was elected. So it was this completely like stunning world history event that happened, followed by this like completion of a process really that was like an emotional breakdown. And, you know, so it was a strange, strange period of time particularly but coming out of it like having finished it having released it even if i wasn't in a good place maybe totally in those weeks right then and there i really felt like i was able to build from there and come out of it because then i i could just put it behind me you know even just like help you know like the stress of finishing a book like the tedious shit like the editing parts and the like you know the 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 finalizing the artwork and like you know asking people for quotes or like whatever like all that stuff to have all that stress of it behind you was like just like it was really good <laughs> and then you do it all over again you know yeah and i guess we're very fortunate in the sense that the world in which we inhabit and that's through design of course but you know the people that we surround ourselves with the the community that we're in obviously pop culture and the left-leaning media, which is generally the stuff that I imagine you and I read, a lot of these spaces are spaces of empathy and understanding and love and support. But as we've learned in the last four years, that's not a reflection of both our countries as a whole um, sure. at all. And and so you had Trump, you had Brexit, and you know I think a lot of people found it quite hard to believe. How did he get into power? How did people in the UK vote for Brexit? But I guess it's because for a lot of people, you're different and I'm different because we travel and we see the world and you see people in different places. And the last four years, I guess, have really taught us that it isn't all, you know, liberal love. It's quite the opposite, in fact. So, I mean, I wonder if you could just shed some light on what it's been like for you in Trump's America over that time, traveling, touring and and being in different spots of the country where perhaps it isn't you know, as liberal and free thinking as Los Angeles or like, well, have I'll, you... I'll tell you, Matt, like my, my perspective on that is, is something I often feel very conflicted about because I don't feel like my, the basis of my perspective is rooted in a liberal left wing perspective, having grown up in a military family and specifically in a military family where my father was stationed in Europe at a NATO base. So like, being heavily influenced at a young age by military politics and specifically the politics of military bases in Europe and why they were there in a post-World War II world and what it was all about with um, even the EU coming together, like really remembering certain historical events like the Berlin Wall coming down, you know, like um, from a military stand family standpoint, which was by no means left leaning to then be in this pace, place where it just seems like everyone's like, 
yeah, never mind about all that. You know, like we don't really care about holding Russia back from coming in and taking over Europe and all that free travel, you know, across Europe that that seemed like was really important and why we were trying to stabilize everything after post post World War II. Like, fuck all that, too. You know, like it just is it doesn't make any fucking sense. Um, and uh, and it's a shame because I really do think that people don't value what it actually means. And I'm so fucking thankful to have had those experiences because it scares me thinking like, damn, like, you know, can, can we never tour like that again? You know, can, can it never be as simple as like, um, you know, the, the Dover and Calais crossing, you know, and, and just being annoyed that you got to wake up for 45 minutes and wander around the ferry in the middle of the night, but then you get to crawl back into your bunk and go to sleep and, and it being fairly easy, you know, like, um, I don't know that there's beauty in that. And I really deeply appreciate it. And I, I think it's a shame if it's lost, you know? Yeah. And the last 12 months in particular, I mean, the personal journey that I've been on, and I'd love to know the journey that you've been on originally was one of like painful transition because you're kind of forced to stop. And, you know, the last way, way more years for you, but the last, five years extensively for me and I imagine 20 for you has been you go out on tour you you know just live in that tour space for however amount of time and then you come home you rest for a bit and then it's straight back out or it's straight into the studio and there's never really that much self-analysis I mean that well there is an always constant ongoing subtle sense of it but this was I think the first time when many of us who spend our lives on the run uh, <laughs> were forced to stare ourselves in the mirror for the first time properly and go, who am I and who do I want to be and where do I want to go from here? I think it's totally healthy too. And you know, it's something that I even like, uh, I had a extreme anxiety about it at first. And, um, I, I kind of got in some arguments about it in ways where like, I fully was wanting to embrace that stop and recognizing for it for what it was where all of a sudden everyone was in the same position of like, all right, no one's going out on tour. Just stop thinking about it, things in terms of album cycles or anything like that. <clears throat> and recognize that this is the first and only time in your life in the past 20 years that you've been able to kind of take that luxury and just take a breath and then reassess and go from there. Not immediately, let's just still stay in this, like this cycle and this anxiety and everything like that, you know, like, cause when else are you going to get a fucking chance like this? You know, like, wh why would you, why would you waste that? You know? Um, I, I, I don't know. So like, I really, uh, you know, I, I tried to, I had to fight it first to kind of make space for myself to be like, leave me the fuck alone. I don't want to do a live stream right now. I just want to wait until we've sorted out live streams a little bit more. Um, and having total Zoom anxiety at first, too. Or just like, you know, I didn't like do any Zooms last year. <laughs> I only started doing Zooms this year. I was just doing phoners the whole time because I find phoners so much more organic. You can just get lost in the story. But then it got to a point where just out of ne needing to change again, because I was getting like sure. <laughs> I was in four or five months of constant phoning now let's try zoom for a bit because it's going to be ongoing <laughs> taste yourself it's a marathon it wasn't it wasn't a sprint is the thing it's like <laughs> i realized that initially it was like just like take a step you know like or take a breath like before you make your next step don't just keep going you know because um but um but it's it's strange like culturally in that way where i really feel it and maybe it's just me i don't know and maybe it's like where this all lined up with my life of like i turned 40 in november i think you're allowed like a little bit of an existential midlife crisis when you turn 40 you know everyone is um but but feeling like you know when it was like 2010 that didn't feel like oh there's this total cultural reset you know like and now music is totally different in the same way that like that divide did feel there from the 80s to the 90s you know like two distinct eras it didn't really feel like that necessarily blending from 2000 the aughts to the teens you know but then you hit the 220 2020s now and i feel that i feel this like and now it's like there's that there's there's this place that we can never go back to and we're moving on from there and it's a great big unknown and everyone's got to reevaluate everything and, and totally reapproach and um, you know, so much has been lost. Some things it like broke, uh, whether that's a business or like a venue or, or 
fucking like friendships or relationships, you know, it just like completely tested things in ways that, um, uh, you know, was a, it was a revelation. <laughs> it's B, C and A, C, isn't it? Before and after Corona. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's a line in the sand. I want to ask you this. We can move on if you don't want to get into it. But the last time we spoke, you were, I think, in the, the early stages of a new relationship. But this was four years ago. Did you go into the pandemic in a relationship? Did you go into it single? And how has it been over the last year, just from a personal romantic point of view? Yeah, no. Um. Well, sadly, uh, that relationship back then, um, that didn't last. It was a long distance relationship, um, a really long distance relationship. So that was you know the failing there unfortunately but um i did not go into the pandemic in a relationship i haven't dated in a second or anything um and maybe i would have been like more concerned about it had i known there was a global pandemic coming up uh but i was really you know i i was in a place of coming still out of as i talked i was talking about of like coming out of the book and like feeling like i was still rebuilding myself and part of that was you know recognizing after the book came out I was like, I need to take a break from dating. I've been like, you know, like the past couple of years have been so overwhelming between like coming out, uh, putting out records, like, like ending relationship, moving on into new relationships, like all that. Like I just took a step back and I was still in that place of rebuilding and now I'm still here. So, yeah. Well, I, I went into the, the pandemic situation fully single thinking this is the worst time ever to be single because how are you going to meet someone or, or enjoy that side of life ever again. I thought, this is it. This is going to be loneliness forever from here on in. But then, very quickly, I realized this is actually an amazing time to be single because imagine being in a new-ish relationship now. The pressure and strain of that. And actually, what it's allowed me to do, at least, is be so selfish with my time and just totally work on me, rebuild my soul almost, take over a whole new kind of lease of life with with health and my attitude towards just living cleanly and and work and being productive. And I think it's actually the best time ever to be single at the moment. If you want to be a selfish creative, which I am. <laughs> I mean, there's no nothing worse than the thought of being like stuck in a space with someone that you realize because of this, you're like, oh, we aren't compatible. Um, and now we still are crushing. But it, but it makes me think about it in that way where like I've, I've never tried any of the like uh, online dating apps or anything like that. Grosses it, me out. The thought of it. it's window shopping for humans. Yeah. Yeah. And it also just, I don't know. So I, maybe this is like totally egotistical. That's fine. Call me out on it. But it, I feel tacky about it. Like that it would look weird if I was on one and people would be like, they're on one of these. They're in a band. Like, why are they on this? You know? So I feel limited in that way. But there is a part of me that's like, I guess that's how you do it now. Cause similarly, like, you know, I've, lived in Chicago eight years now, but of that eight years, I've been touring so much. And then when I come home, I'm a parent, so I don't have a social life. And then now it's like, oh, well, now I've just been home for a year, but I have no hope of developing a social life because there's a global pandemic. And what do you do? How do you go out and meet people in a global pandemic other than digitally in Zooms or if it's an app or something? So I'm, I'm stuck in that place. You know, I'm torn between worlds. Did you originally move to Chicago? Am I right in thinking this? Because that's where your daughter was based and growing up and you wanted to be near her. Was that why Chicago was your spot? Because I'd love to know how you're getting on with Chicago as a place after releasing a song called I Hate Chicago before then being trapped there. Um, how yeah. are you in Chicago these days? Um, well, yes, that is that is how I ended up here. Um, but also, like, I kind of ended up here realistically because... I was at a point in life where, you know, I had built a studio in Florida. They got destroyed in a storm. So it was like this, you know, you're forced to a point of change. Um, got to do something and needed to get away from Florida. Had already tried living in L.A., didn't like it. New York was unaffordable. So, I mean, there's like those are the three big cities in the U.S. that to me are like the three iconic cities. And it's like East Coast, West Coast, right in the middle. So I had some other family in the area. So Chicago is where we ended up. But, you know, I, I can talk a lot of shit about Chicago um, and, and that's fine. I have the right to do that. I live here. But I will say, like, with a song like I Hate Chicago, like, you got to realize that, like, that's part of Chicago identity is hating Chicago. <laughs> like, some of the most famous Chicago writers, like Nelson Algren wrote The, the Man with the Golden Arm, uh, Walk on the Wild Side, like, 
the scathing things he would say about Chicago, um, just like tearing it apart, had nothing good to say about it. And he's like the Chicago writer, you know, there's statues of him in parts. Like, um, so I, I feel like that song's, you know, if you live here, you get it. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> So you reckon it'll be your base and, and dare I say at home for, for a while once we come out of this thing and free movement is once again more actively encouraged? Do you think you'll still stay put on the, the long term tip? I, no. I, well, you know, I don't know, Matt, if you saw that Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live skit where they were making fun of people for like looking on Zillow at real estate and like, <laughs> no, you know, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> well you look it up after this but you know it's making fun of people and how like if you're not careful like you could potentially end it end up buying a really ugly but affordable mansion in some place like north carolina because there is really extremely affordable real estate there it's just in the middle of nowhere but so i i felt personally attacked by that that skit because like i definitely like that's my like fetish right now is i i go online and i dream of other places and i look at like you know like tracts of land expanses in the middle of nowhere and i'm like i don't know i, I could live there it's only eighty thousand dollars for like 30 acres you know you know um so i don't know but th but i guess that is the question of realistically when i come down to it when i'm like i you know for for any trash i could talk about chicago uh when it comes down to it when i ask myself the question of like well where would you go i'm i'm at a loss i can't answer it right now so what do you do in that situation I'd love to talk to you about some of the key lessons you've learned in the pandemic times. Um, I know it might seem like an obvious line of questioning, but in relation to where you base yourself, because I've learned that really I don't want to live in London ever again. I got out, I got out of there in August because I could no longer afford to stay. All my work as a DJ dried up. And so I was like, well, I've got to just move back home with my folks. So I'm living in the area that I grew up. I know I don't want to stay here either. But I just have no desire to return to London. And, and I do feel like now the industry's changed so much. So many people have left. And I think this will be the case across the board in all countries and cities like these capital cities and places where all culture and economy and everything used to kind of congregate and center around is now going to be spread out a lot more because of people working from home and Zooming and doing all of that. I feel now I can freely live anywhere and do what I do. Um, can you see yourself would be my question then not being in the city and, and being in the country, being somewhere quiet and more rural. And that's not an age thing. Either. No, totally not, at all. not an attack on the forties. <laughs> Cause I found myself really enjoying being in the more rural spots and enjoying a more subdued pace of life. I've actually really sure. embraced it. Sure. Well, you, you know, it's wild when you do realize certain things over the course of the pandemic of, you know, not driving as much or whatever, realizing like, wait, how much am I spending in parking living in a city? You know, or how much am I getting nailed for in speeding tickets or like what those expenses are of actually living in a city? You know, you look at it and you look at what you're really getting for it sometimes and you're like, this isn't fucking worth it. And like, I'm making that joke talking about that. And like, really like part of what spurs me on looking for it is I, I calculate the costs where I'm like, wait, I have to have a storage unit to store all of the against me backline right now, which costs X amount of money. And then I have to have like a separate rehearsal space than my apartment because I can't make noise in my apartment. So that costs me like combined. I'm spending more than a mortgage to rent these other small spaces where you could just move to the country and be paying less than all of it combined. You have all this space to make as much noise and do whatever you want in. There's appeal in that. And, you know, when you're a musician, you need space, like you need space to be loud. And that's a, that's a frustrating hurdle to get over when you're living in an apartment, you're a musician and there's a global pandemic. So I have these fantasies of like, what you know whatever happened to the day of like the, the the awesome punk house communes like let's just get a group of people together like all pitch in and get a get big old farmhouse up in the middle of nowhere art, artistic commune you know like if it's if it's affordable enough it could be a punk rock timeshare people could just come out and hang out for a little bit then go back to the city like because i gotta i gotta be here in chicago to some extent but damn you know like the affordability of other places like what are you paying for in a city especially if you can't fucking go anywhere yeah i kind of feel like i'd fit really neatly into that model of um 
a house share, but not with fucking students who just want to get pissed and, and, you know, rage all week. Because I do feel like, unfortunately, <laughs> at a certain age, or everybody I know at least, is like married, mortgage, kids, that's it. And so you kind of then will go, who's, who's still doing it? And yeah, <laughs> it's funny. I, creativity is such a strange thing. And I feel like this year I've really seen who the true creative people are. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Because I've witnessed a lot of people, I'm not going to name names or directly slag anyone off, but there's there's been a lot of people that I've seen who've just kind of given up and they've just sat on their ass for a year and gone, I'm just going to wait for shows to come back. They haven't put out a record. They haven't really done anything. And they've kind of been totally against the idea, whether knowingly or not, of adapting to roll with the punches. And I feel like this last year has put the creative industry, obviously, in a totally new light of like, well, I see like when you put out your record, for instance, I just thought, yeah, that's how it's done. You've got the songs, you get the space, you get the guy who's going to work with you and make it happen. And that's it. You don't need a whole band. You don't need anything else. Just get out there and get it done. And that goes back to punk rock for me. Um, and if you are creative, you find a way, right? No matter what restrictions are in place, if you want to get it done, you will find a way if you truly want to do it. For, for sure. And to me, really, when I was talking it out in my head, the only arguments against doing stuff like that were purely from the business standpoint of like, you might not sell as many copies of your record. So if like, that's the sacrifice you have to make, like, personally, I'm, I'm all about like, think about it more about in the long term, you know, like, and I try to talk about that with any record label I've ever worked with of like, like, I don't know if I'm ever going to be the, you know, musician or in the band that like puts out a record and the first week it sells a million copies, but I'll forever be the band that year after year goes out and tours and plays 150 shows a year and sells three or four records from every show and it'll just continue like that you know like um so trying to think in that more long-term way i've always been a bit been about but that, those were the only reasons not to and and if that is your job if your job is being an artist and being creative and you are now faced with the set of limitations and those limitations are so clearly identifiable as out of your control it doesn't have anything to do with you you know there's a fucking pandemic like if you cannot adapt and work in those situations you are not worth your soul at what, what you're doing you know like then you fucking failed and it's time to retire um and that's like the the separating the wheat from the chef and like the old world dying away um and and it's like brutal but it's it's you know pretty visible amen and how refreshing to hear that somebody else feels that way because you never want to make anybody else feel bad for being lazy but then after a year of it you kind of do because there's only so much sympathy before you go well you could just get up and put at least you know, an EP out or do one song or anything. And, you know, look at all the artists in movements, centuries, periods gone by, you know, where there's say, you know, you're a Jewish artist in the Holocaust. Like that is a real <laughs> threat to your livelihood. That is a physical life threat to your livelihood. But yet there was still people that would have found ways to create in those circumstances. So, I think we can adapt in the pandemic and still create and release stuff, right? No? Any, yeah. any artist working through World War II, specifically living in Europe, like imagine working in those conditions, you know? And then realistically, like thinking about it now comparatively and realizing like, well, I still got it pretty fucking good comparatively. Like I've got internet. You know, like they didn't, you didn't have the internet working as an artist back then, you know? So just like comparatively, like realizing like, okay, you know, um, I, I, I can keep doing this. Uh, but and, and maybe it means like you have to completely refigure out what you're doing. Maybe it means you're not putting out records anymore. Maybe it means you're completely just putting out singles. Maybe it means you're just completely like reevaluating. And, you know, I've even I've talked about it a little bit with some friends and, and people about how like take advantage of this time to like woodshed. That's like the, the the term for it, I think, where you really like hunker down and focus on on your craft in a different way, you know, and. <clears throat> when I think about the people that I really admire that I've toured with over the years and specifically the people who aren't necessarily in the bands, like who aren't musicians, the crew members, when I think about people like that, I really admire like that, like what I always admire is their adaptability and how I'll notice that when they're not able to do one thing, they're doing another thing, you know, like if they're on the bus and they can't be working on uh, you know, 
I don't know, they'll, they'll be like redesigning a home project or they'll be thinking about something to do with the studio. When they're not on tour, they're working on a studio. They're doing something on their home. When they're like in the backstage dressing room, they're they're answering an email. They're like restringing a guitar, like constantly doing something or figuring out a way to make your craft better from a different angle. Sorry, that was rambly. No, no, it's people who get shit done, no matter yeah. what the context or, you know, hurdles that are put up around them. I'm here to get it done. So let's find a way under, over, around but either way i'm not just going to sit here and look at the thing and go oh well when that moves then we'll push forward so yeah. just kick it out of the way <laughs> <laughs> i'd love to see how much well we will but how much in the coming months things will change and i do feel like a lot of positives you know obviously you have to look at the the human cost and the the tragedy of the death rates and and things like this which you know is just heartbreaking but as with every painful period of transition there will be i think positives that come out of it um and i do feel from a diy ground level kind of arena i think there'll be such thriving communities and artistic movements in the years and months that come i feel like the roaring 20s we we wanted that when we went into 2020 and then it very quickly got shut down but i do feel like from 2022 on Maybe a bit of this year if we get lucky, but I think the Roaring Twenties are coming back, and I think it's going to be from the ground level up one of the most creative and exciting decades ever. I think the eternal <laughs> optimist, but <laughs> I want to share that optimism with you. I, there's nothing more uh, I would like than to be in some random field in France with you, uh, standing behind a DJ booth and <laughs> <laughs> in some kind of insane scenario. Um, I really uh, would like that again. But, you know, I was going to say, um, like, the one show I technically have on the books right now is the 2000 Trees Festival in July. Amazing. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, I know they're continuing it on like it's happening. And my, inside, I'm like, I want it to happen. But there's a part of me that's like, there's no fucking way. What do you think? July? July. Yeah. I, d I mean, I don't hold my breath for this year, full stop. But, um, yeah. you know, I like that people have hope. I like that the shows are being announced. I like that everybody's getting excited about them because it feels like even if you're not being realistic about this, at least you're putting the, the past behind you. You're looking forward. Um, the, the one problem I do have, though, Laura, is people who seem to have learned nothing in the last year and are just like, can't wait to get out. You know, we all are excited for gigs to return. We all want to be back at shows, seeing live music, socializing with the people that we love, meeting new people, having a good time. But it's those who are like, oh, I can't wait to just be in a field with all my mates having a laugh. It's like, well, have you kind of done no self reassessment or learned really nothing about yourself or the world in this time? Is it literally just been you sat on a couch going, get me back to the gig, get me back? <laughs> that kind of seems crazy to me. <laughs> but again, you know, who can I? Who am I to shoot down those that are just excited to enjoy some form of normality once again? Sure, I think honestly too that um, that people will realize really quick that it's not going to be as simple as just like all of a sudden going back to the show and picking up like nothing happened. Um, and I think about that a lot about how like I you know what kind of like anxiety repercussions am I going to feel like about this or or how you know how. Um, <clears throat> that shows will come back and touring will start again but one thing that i think will be a long long time before it comes back is like going out after a show and taking pictures with people and hugging them and uh having a conversation or sharing a joint or like something like that like you just you know that aspect of will still be like oh well we shouldn't talk we shouldn't be close you know like and that's crazy to me that's so sad you know yeah, I have no desire to go to distanced shows. If artists want to play them, then I completely say do that because you deserve to earn some money and do what you do. And I'm never going to knock anybody for performing distant shows. But there's no appeal in that to me. I would sooner just wait, even if it is for me. I'm waiting another year whilst everybody else is doing shows. I'm there going to remember. I would sooner wait until I can just, not that I do this, but crowd surf. You know? <laughs> I, I can go and get sweaty and touch people and don't have to worry about distancing because rock and roll shouldn't have to be about that. Oh, no, not at all. I did, <laughs> I did get the opportunity recently and it didn't work out. I had a conflict, but uh, we almost were going to play a drive-in show, which I just wanted to do, even though I know it would be horrible, kind of. But I was like, that seems so weird. I just want to do it to say I did it. Um, but similarly, like, I can't, like, live streams. I did the one back in October and I, I've been thinking about doing another. 
Um, but I, I, there's a part of me that's just like, this sucks. <laughs> like It's just abysmal. You know, I want shows. I want real shows, the real thing. That's what I signed up for, you know? Yeah. And that's when you know that you're not in it for the money. And again, some people need to make that money and I get that, but I think it's those that are like, right, let's just get on the streams. Let's stream, 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 stream. Cause that's a business decision. And again, I'm not criticizing anyone, but I feel like the ones that are truly in it for not the right reasons, because there's no such thing as that, but the same reasons that I'm in it for is the authenticity of that feeling. Um, it can't be. I always used to say the one thing that we can't replicate is the live show. Although the music industry has been decimated by streaming, it's OK, because the one thing that we can't replicate in a digital form is a live show. And then the pandemic hits and here we are. And I'm like, fuck. I guess that's it. <laughs> well, it's like that. But it's true. You, know, you can't replicate it, can you? Because it doesn't give you the same feeling as being in a room with a crowd. No, it's like, you know, it makes me think of that. Uh, what's that one Joe Strummer doc where they're talking about how towards the end of Joe's life, um, you know, he got into going to the festivals and like sitting around the campfire. And it's really about the communal gathering, you know, and um, the future's yeah. unwritten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> you, you can't replicate that online. It just doesn't work. Are you still sober? Yeah. You look amazing. Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> so, so I've just, you know, like 45 minutes into the chat, I'm like, hi, by the way, you, you look well, but you look, you look incredible. And a lot of that has to be down. I've noticed this in a lot of people. And there's a reason why those people that are like <laughs> vegan and sober and 50 look like they're about 30. And those that are eating pork chops and still drinking beer look about a hundred. And it's kind of like just scientifically right there. You can see the effects everywhere you go um i would love to if you don't mind get into the the, the start of that journey was there a, a moment or a thing that inspired that change or was it a gradual build-up or what was the initial push that made you want to at least try out that lifestyle for a little while if even if it wasn't always going to be a long-term thing i guess you know it was really again going back to talking about coming out of finishing the book and like realizing you know it, at that point, getting control of my life, cleaning up a bunch of like, you know, like unfinished things that needed to be taken care of. And then realizing that there were certain coping mechanisms that I was using in a in a bad way, um, even just like getting through a book, even like falling into the classic cliche of, you know, you're working on a book and you're late, late at night and you're drinking whiskey or something, you know, <laughs> smoking cigarettes. Um, but like really um, falling back into running again, too um was something that like drove me further and further towards a healthy lifestyle and just you get older and you have like less and less time for the bullshit you know and i i, I don't I, I you know i don't go to like meetings or anything like that i didn't go to like a rehab or anything like that i just decided on august 31st um what was it 2018 now 2018 i was like i'm done and that was it. Then September 1st, I, you know, that was it. I just stopped. And, um, and then just have further gotten into running and like physical fitness and stuff like that. And a lot of that is like the getting old and realizing like, oh, if you don't like take care of your body, that shit's going to fall apart. But, you know, this past October, I was actually supposed to run the Chicago marathon. Um, so I had been like training for that as a goal. And then the marathon didn't happen, but I was, I was running for a charity called the big shoulders foundation. Um, and, uh, so my, my enrollment deferred to this year. So now I have like an extended training period, but I fucking broke my foot this last November. So I did have that happen, but I'm all better now. So, yeah. It's really interesting for me because I have a constant inner dialogue or battle with sobriety versus not. And, you know, <laughs> I spent the first two months of this year which isn't an extended time, but I tend to do January every year sober anyway. I do dry January every year just to hit reset and have a cleanse after Christmas. And this year I thought I'm going to do February too. And those first two months of this year were so, I was just so happy and so productive and felt so great. And so now I've got a new approach to alcohol and drugs and everything else, wherein I'm going to pick because it's 2021 this year. I'm going to pick 21 days and I get a cheat day, 21 days out of the year where I get to smoke and do whatever else, drink, have fun. Then the rest of the time, I'm just 100% sober because 
I'm in a point where I know one day I want to be sober and I know that I'm healthier and happier when I am, but I still have this side that's just like, but I just love it. I just love it so much. And what I would love to hear your, your reflections on Laura is so many of my absolute favorite moments in life have been born out of alcohol or another intoxication. You referenced a festival in France where we first met a moment ago. And there's so many nights like that where, you know, the connection has been heightened by something that alters the state of mind that you're in. And I just feel like so many of my favorite friendships and moments and memories wouldn't have happened were it not for these forces. And there's, there is, I think, a positive side to them. And there is positive things to gain from them if they're used correctly. But I would love to know about your relationship to the the spiritual side of partying, if there is such a thing. Well, like with what you're saying about right there, I think the point is, is that I recognize there are times like that and that I love those moments and I love being drunk in those moments, literally on alcohol and then also metaphorically drunk on the moment. But then there's also recognizing that there there's other times where you're not in one of those moments. And in order to be able to control and allow yourself to have one of those moments, like in some weird field in France, um, those other moments, you have to rein it in and control yourself. So for instance, in the middle of a global pandemic, like we're not hanging out, unfortunately, Matt, I'm stuck in an apartment in Chicago. And if I'm going to drink, I'm drinking alone, you know, (laughs) then it's going to be really depressing and really dark. And let's be honest, it will not be building momentum. It will not be any adding anything good to my life. It will not be making me a better parent, et cetera, et cetera. But I still want to be able to eventually recognize if one of those moments are happening where I'm on an adventure, that if like someone's like, let's drink some sangria, we're on top of a mountain in Spain, that I'm going to have some fucking sangria and I'll have earned it and prove that I can control it and handle it because of those other moments. I wasn't abusing it. That's why I'm trying to do these 21 days thing, because then through doing that, there's never any drinking alone, never any drinking at home, never any drinking when I'm sad or depressed or down or trying to escape anything. It's just I'm out with a group of friends one day when that returns. The moment feels right. I'm going to cash in one of these tokens. And then the thing is, if I get carried away and all of a sudden it's like every other day I'm having one, once those 21 are gone, then I have to stay 100% sober for the rest of the year till we start a new year and I cash in a new load. And then I learn the discipline of it. So I'll let you know how I get on, like, you know, a year or so down the line, how my my token system is working out. But I just, I feel like I'm not ready yet to say goodbye to it completely. Um, But I've definitely had to change my relationship with it because when I was writing my book, I fell into that trap completely. I'm Hunter S. Thompson now. I even did a cartoon, you know, recreation of Fear and Loathing on the cover with me as him. And I was drinking and whilst writing the book, it was great. But then I'd gotten into this lifestyle and once I'd finished the book, but the lifestyle was still there and I'm in a pandemic and it's just weird. It was, I knew time was, was, you know, it was time to change. Yeah. You know, and well, when it comes down to it for me too, like, uh, I was raised by, um, a, you know, financially responsible adult. My dad was really financially responsible or whatever. And there are certain lessons that he ingrained in me that I have never been able to let go of. And I've been self-destructive in a lot of ways, but part of my story has never been being like wantonly reckless with money or anything like that. So when you're in a band and you're be- being given a lot of free alcohol, Um, that's a different kind of drinking than when you realize like, wait, how much am I paying for alcohol a week? And I'm able to usually compartmentalize stuff in my head where when I have realizations like that, you know, like I'm like, never mind the liver damage, like, (laughs) like, you know, um, but anyways, yeah. Well, that's how people ruin their lives, don't they? It's because they lose their jobs and you know, then the economic pressure is on and that's, you know, the whole other side to it is like, if it's getting in the way of your responsibilities, And then, you know, the other side is when you live in a fairly irresponsible world, such as the music industry, where, as you say, it's kind of like as long as you show up and perform on time and deliver the best of your ability on the night, the rest of it, people are there taking care of the the stress of day to day life for you, aren't they? They're getting you from A to B. They're taking care of your food, you know, your pocket money, if you will, your per diems, all of that. So you can kind of just switch off and grow, grow, go into, sorry, cruise control. And then that can be a bad (laughs) 
uh, I don't know. It can be a bad attitude to then take into just day to day regular life, can't it? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> How have you found like that side of it? Just not being around your crew, your team of people. I imagine like me. So I'm a very sociable person who loves being surrounded by people and loves connecting with people. And that's why I do what I do. And I thought in the first few weeks of lockdown, this is going to be a miserable, lonely existence. But actually, very quickly, I adapted to the whole lone wolf. There's strength in being alone and, I don't know, growing and focusing on me. And I've actually found that the, the reflection and growth I've been able to do has been a product of being on my own. Have you been happy in this time? For the lot, I know you've had your daughter for months on months off. We'll talk about that in a bit as well. But have you found yourself happy and content in your own company, particularly in this specific set of circumstances? You know, I actually had a really specifically related to this realization this morning when I was writing my morning pages in my journal of that realizing um, in the best way that anything that I still have a problem with or that I'm still unhappy about in my life or with my person that I used to contribute to whatever stresses there were of being in a band and being on tour, any of those things that still exist now, a year after of not being on tour that are still there, I can't blame on the band anymore, you know, and that it proves to me that being in a band and touring and all that stuff, that they're just immensely positive things <laughs> in my life. So what, cause they weren't causing whatever thing I was like, that's causing that problem. Like, it's like, nope, nope. It didn't have anything to do with that. It was all you. You got to solve it on your own now, you know, stop blaming being a musician or being in a band or traveling all the time, you know? Um, so that I feel like is a really good right realization to have. And you've enjoyed the process of being alone for so long or have you not? How have you found it or has it been uh, crushing? I've had good days. I've had bad days. I've had really crushing days. I, you know, you, you were saying it a second ago, like I do month on month off parenting. So, uh, you know, I have my daughter with me this month. They're in the other room. They're FaceTiming with a friend. Um, and then like last month I was just alone by myself. I didn't see another human being except for the, you know, I've been doing this Vans DJ gig where I go in once a month and I play songs for two hours. I saw I that. Yeah. It's fun. And I see one person when I get there. I see Chuck and Chuck lets me in and I get set up and I go. Um, so that's the one person I saw last month. But, you know, so, you know, talking about breaking my foot, like, OK, so I broke my foot on my last day of being 39 years old. And the next day, my 40th birthday, I was alone. I didn't have my daughter that month. Um, so I spent my 40th birthday alone, lying on my couch with it, my foot elevated, packed in ice, not yet fully knowing it was broken because I hadn't been able to go to the doctor, but unable to walk and pretty damn sure and uh, that it was broken. And my friend sent me Postmates. Uh, they sent me a don like some donuts and coffee for my birthday. And I live a couple floors up, no elevator. So I had to fashion like a cane out of a baseball bat with the towel duct taped around the end to hobble down the stairs to get my fucking iced coffee and donut and then hobbled back up the stairs to then plop back on the couch where I sat and ate my donut and drank my iced coffee with a fucking broken foot. Um, but that was like just the most depressing birthday ever. Just completely alone. Didn't see anyone broken foot. Like your body's telling, telling you like you're old, you're falling apart. It sucked. Happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Wow. There's something really symbolic about that. It was the day before your big 4-0 that you did the break as well. That was when that happened. Yes, the day before. So. <laughs> wow. How old, how old is your daughter now? Uh, 11. Wow. So about to hit the turbulent teens. Does that worry you? A little bit, except for that. Uh, they're really well adjusted and like, really, I don't know. They're just a cool kid. And, um, yeah, I'm not too worried about it, but a little bit. <laughs> Obviously, I guess, you know, we spoke in, in my book about the stuff that you got up to as a kid. And there's a line that I'll never forget, which is one of my favorite little quotes in the book where you say, you know, your mom was always there to bail you out. And so, I guess there's the thing of when, when the parent is someone like you who's pulled every trick that there is and, you know, <laughs> made every, not mistake, but, you know, has done every deed that there is to do, I guess you're wise to it, right? So there's never going to be anything slip past you. So oh, uh, I, I say that to, to her all the time where I'm like, you know that look you're giving me right now? I invented that look. I invented that look. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know. Um, your mum as well. Every time I share something on Facebook, I'm presuming it's your mum, Bonnie, right? Yeah, that's my mum. She, she yeah. always just either like a big smile emoji or a big heart emoji, and you can feel the love and pride and uh, and strength of that bond coming off on the. And that's hard to. That's increasingly rare to see on the the social media sphere these days it becomes over time i found an increasingly more dark less positive and radiant place and so it's usually just on your birthday or whatever i'll be like happy birthday laura or maybe i'll share an article or something but whenever i do your mom's always there and i'm always like wow that's so cool that she just loves laura so much and <laughs> there must be a bit of you that's like chill out mum." but why why the hell not it's facebook it should be, I think, still from time to time, a place of love and joy. And sure, yeah. and she, you know, if if you're if if it's a if it's a concert, she's invited to the concert too. You know, metaphorically speaking, I'm sure she'll comment and 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 post another heart emoji or something when you when we we announce this this uh this chat here. Um, but but yeah, she's in the room too. I like that. You know. Oh, she's at your flat now as well. Oh, no, no. I mean, like metaphorically in yeah. the room of social media. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're all in this conversation together. That's what's happening. And sometimes you wish people would shut the fuck up. But we're all in here together. You know, what's your relationship like with the old social media at the moment? Has it changed over the last year? <sighs> it has. Yeah. Sorry, there's an ambulance going by. Um, oh, uh, it has definitely, you know, and there's there was like a period early on where i I felt like I had to force myself to have a freak out so I could like break my cycle with it um, to even just like, like, don't pick it up first thing in the morning, you know, don't do that morning scroll while you're still lying in bed. But then like, I've, I've, it's, it's crazy just being at that point where it's like been a year where you're able to look back and be like, well, at this point in the pandemic, I was like this with my relationships with social media. And then like, you know, where I got really burnt out after putting out the record in October, after putting out Stay Alive. Like I didn't, I wasn't prepared for that. I got burned out on social media and I got burnt out doing press in general where I took it for granted of like how much you get back from playing a show. Like I can go on tour for three months straight and play a show six days a week and do press every day, right? But I can't do that if I'm not playing the show every day because you need that show to give you back. And I, yeah, that was a low point with social media. Yeah, there's there's one thing that I've noticed, which, you know, is in effect in politics, but just in almost every element of life now as well. And this pandemic has really brought it into focus, which is <laughs> everybody loves to tell everybody now what you can and can't say, think, feel or do. And I don't just mean in reference to cancel culture. I just mean everything, everything in life. There's so much judgment and like shit talking. And it just feels like everybody is out to attack and, and criticize and it's a gnarly space in so many ways now. And so what I've done this year is really just like remove it. I'll use it to promote what I do, but I spend so little time actually on there, like existing on there because it just seems to me, and I guess it's because people have had so much time on their hands. That's it, right? Is people with too much time on their hands are just sat looking on social media rather than getting out and doing stuff. And so they're then just like, you can't say that. You can't go outside and do this and do that. And the best one is they'll go, look at all these scumbags on the beach. And it's like, well, you're on the beach taking the photo. <laughs> if you don't want to see other people, then maybe stay home. And I get that if there's like loads of people, you know, in a group that's larger than the group that they're allowed to be in and they're all mingling, whatever, then that might be a cause for concern. But maybe just concentrate on yourself and focus on you. It's vicious. But see, then there's been other moments where, where I have been like, I'm really thankful for this lifeline right now of having anyone to talk to, especially like, you know, when I, my foot was still freshly broken, where I, like I was then even more confined. There was a global pandemic and I couldn't walk, you know, and I'm stuck alone in my apartment for a month and it just sucked. So being able to talk to people then, like there were moments where I was like, I appreciate this. And then there's been connections too that have happened where it's like, oh, cool. This is like, a way to do some kind of work during the pandemic where it's like, I always see the value then. Um, it's just like, yeah, it's a real, it's a cruel mistress, man. It's it is, isn't it? That's exactly <laughs> what it is. And I think Twitter for me is where you excel at social media. There's even when I can tell from like a certain tone of a tweet, like maybe you're not having the best time as of late, there's still this hopeless romanticism and optimism 
underscored with perhaps some cynicism, but in a, in a way that's funny and not negative. Um, you know, and I don't spend a lot of time on Twitter because there's too many opinions on there. I prefer Instagram because it's more visual. But whenever I do go on Twitter and I see a tweet from you, I'm like, ah, oh, that's made me feel better about myself and the world. <laughs> So thank you for all that you share on Twitter, Laura. You're a positive force. <laughs> My pleasure. I think, you know, I, I, I try to utilize it in that way of like sometimes of being like thought dumps, you know, where you're like not necessarily paying attention to the reaction because the reactions will drive you nuts. Like the other day, you know, posting something randomly where my, my fucking back hurts, right? And I was like, I'll give someone $100 if you can make my back stop hurting right now. And you look at the replies to that and it's everyone's like, well, if you do this kind of exercise, if you do this, you know, like, and it's like, no, 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 no. I just want an instantaneous, make my fucking back stop hurting right now. Don't tell me what to do. Um, but so it's like, I, I, I hope that people realize at this point, like that that's my actual tone of voice most of the time, you know, of, of no, the tone comes across. It really does. And I think it's hard to be funny on social media when, you know, so much tone does get lost. And I think now what's really funny is we obviously grew up in a time before the internet. And so you know that just because something is written down, like it would be like the equivalent of when we were at school, someone would write on a post-it note and stick it on the wall. And then you'd see it and go, well, that's true because somebody's written it and shared it. So it has to be factually correct. And <laughs> what I think gets lost is you might write something that's a joke, first of all, just a silly thing that is not grounded in fact, or it's an outright lie. But I do feel like people now think just because you share a thought on the internet, it's like factually a true representation, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, I had no idea. So, like, well, no, it's clearly a joke. It's clearly a joke. How do you not see that? <laughs> but so much of that gets lost, doesn't it now? It does. It does. <laughs> Can we talk about punk rock, Laura? We can. I love talking about punk rock. It's a subject that you and I, I think we explored it a little bit in relation to, to your book. But I would love to know just from a historical point of view, not a personal, but a historical point of view. Where does punk begin for you in the timeline and history of music? Well, I, I buy in to uh, Question Mark and the Mysterians being the very first punk rock band because they were the first band referred to as punk in print um and i like the ideas of punk rock having started in michigan technically where they were from um but you know there's there's that which is all afterthought of uh, knowledge that i've gained over the years you know and then there's I'd, like I'd where did that. Punk rock start for me where did like and for me punk rock started in a different place you know the first fans i got into but 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 question mark and the mysterians in my opinion first punk band well i'm all about that too that era of like the sonics the seeds that kind of garage rock mid 60s proto punk stuff i think is absolutely it and question mark i'll tell you a funny story about them i interviewed alice cooper years and years and years ago for my radio show on kerrang and i was like who's like the most zany weird person you've interviewed alice because he had a radio show at the time i think he still does and he was like well question mark and the mysterians was pretty strange he was like he was convinced that he was he was from mars but he says you don't live on mars you live in mars <laughs> and he was going on about how this guy and i guess that did they find him on the street or something what's the story behind him he's he's yeah. one of those dudes if you read up about his personal history zany and incredible but yeah he believes that he's from mars and that you don't live on mars you live in it right and well they they started in bay city michigan which is also where madonna's from so there's something weird happening in Bay City, Michigan. But I like I love his his backstory. There's a couple like documentary things you can find out there. And there's a book specifically called Madonna Land that talks about Bay City, Michigan and the mystery of Bay City, Michigan. But uh uh yeah. Um but but like personally like getting into punk rock, I got in uh, you know, my first two bands were the Sex Pistols and then the Clash, and then it all spread out from there. But uh, UK punk rock was what personally influenced me most, first and foremost. And then I got into more of the US punk rock. Yeah, it's funny. I always have kind of quite heated debates with some of my UK friends because a lot of them are just like, nah, American punk doesn't count. You know, it's the Pistols, it's the Clash, it's the Buzzcocks, it's the Damned, and that's it. And I'm like, so no Stooges, no Ramones, none of that. No, they're like, nah, nah. And I'm like, you're insane. There's no reasoning with you. There's no logic behind these thoughts that you're throwing around. But it's interesting that it was the UK that was what piqued your interest first. Um, was that because were you on the base getting records? How, when and where were you getting exposed to that stuff as a um, kid? 
you know, it was it was really specifically the Sex Pistols, and they were like there was like, you know, I remember seeing graffiti on walls in Italy, just like the Sex Pistols spray painted on walls, and then you know Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses, he wore the Sid. Uh, lock and chain so I started wearing a Sid lock and chain even not knowing it was for Sid Vicious and then like they, their name as a band just like you know it felt more dangerous than any other band name when you're eight years old you know because it has the word sex in it you know um and and so like they were my real introduction into it um and they have were you like, ever met John Lydon I have not no I've never met any of the the Sex Pistols yeah I had him on this show and he was amazing he was incredible. I was terrified going into it, and I thought this guy's going to chew me up, spit me out. Please don't be horrible. Please don't be, you know, a vicious arsehole because he can be that. Um, but he was so sweet and sincere and intelligent and articulate, and he just seemed like a beautiful man. I think I got him on a good day. Yeah, you know, I I know that. Like I I've, I've listened to the podcast. Like I and I know you you like you champion him, and like I don't want to get into any of like i get it he's johnny fucking rotten and i'm not gonna talk about any of the things surrounding him because i'm not gonna argue any of it you know like i I, like but undeniably that's the case you know like i got into the sex pistols i loved the sex pistols when i was 13 years old you know and they were heavily influential on me and i i read his book when i was 13 years old and I, I got in trouble in biology class because I had finished a test and was sitting reading it and the teacher told me to stop reading. And I was like, fuck you, I'm reading a book, you know, like, um, so there was that, you know, and I, and I, I really, um, I love Public Image Limited too, um, but, but, Incredible you know, the, band. Then I went like, you know, then it was the clash and then like into the American world of like the dead Kennedys and stuff like that. And there was, you know, the whole arc of like first being really attracted to the nihilism of punk rock and the live fast, die young. And, you know, that that's that's stemming from like I listened to classic rock first, you know, and bands like The Doors and Jimi Hendrix and all these singers who died at 27. And then that, trend, you know, Sid Vicious, same thing. But then you realize after a while, like the interconnection of it all, you know, and, and even now, like looking back at it where you're like you look at like movements talking about like to where we were talking early, early in this conversation about like being an artist working through world war two and and stuff like that. And you look at like the Dada movement and surrealist movement and stuff like that. And and you realize like, Oh wait, these people were like putting out zines and everything they were doing was like DIY. And you realize like, Oh, like this, it's all connected in different ways and really it's just like you're just giving it different names in different eras but it's all an extension of itself in different ways um which is cool as long as it can keep, keeps continuing on you know yeah i think as well all the most interesting and timeless bands are the ones that they're not just referencing rock and roll like they're not just a rock and roll band they're referencing things like Dadaism or certain artistic movements surrealism cubism or philosophies or great poets and there's always more to the music than just here's some basic chords and a catchy chorus you know because there's bands like that say acdc the greatest rock and roll band ever there's no depth to that music really it's just down the line rock and roll but i think i'm always drawn most you know the stooges for instance you can tell there's real intelligence and stuff going on there even though the sonic kind of attack is so brutal and seems so stripped back and raw there's there's layers to it right is that sure. what for you makes you want to be, you know, an artist as opposed to just a songwriter or musician is having weight and, and substance to what you say beyond just I'm parking my garage. Uh, what's the, <laughs> I'm parking my Mustang in the fucking lot. I really think it I think that it, most of I think it's got to be in simpler terms, really, of that. Like, for me, what does it is that I have forever been trying to replicate whatever good feeling I got the first time I connected with a rock and roll song, you know, like on a personal level, whatever release, chemical release happens in your brain when you're like, damn, that's a good song that just fucking hits my heart or it makes me feel this way. Like whatever happens in that, that first time, you know, like you just, I've just been chasing that ever since, you know, and and you recreate that in those moments of like when you play the best show ever or when you like really like come up with a cool song in the studio, you know, you like I've been working on a demo the past couple of days and 
like I get so into working on it and then I'll have these moments where I'll just sit there and I'll listen to it like 20 times in a row because I'm so happy about the way it's turning out and it gives me such a good feeling and that's what keeps you going and like that'll eventually wear out I'll eventually be like I'm sick of this song I don't want to hear this song time to put it out and let other people hear it and then it's about I got to find that again I got to reproduce that feeling again you know like it chase heart must be the hardest thing to capture on a record right like what you're saying there heart and soul and whether it is the more quote unquote punk stuff that you've written over the years with against me um i'd say the most recent two projects like have obviously branched out from what people would consider quote unquote punk again but there's so much heart in all your music that just jumps off the record and it's always been there and yeah, I never really thought about it in that way. Like you're trying to encapture the emotion, the truth. It's all about just chasing that like first high, right? <laughs> but yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. Because um, there's a couple of tunes, particularly on the latest solo record, that for me almost remind me of like a kind of a, a Wes Anderson vibe. And I mean that as a compliment. Like, I'll there's take this, I love Wes Anderson, yeah. There's a wistfulness <laughs> there. Um, and a timelessness and an international tone as well, whether you're, you know, speaking with a French accent or you're referencing specific locations in Europe or wherever else or America. And there's this kind of, I don't know, it, with the last two records, the, the Devouring Mothers one and the Solar one, have you been consciously trying to move in a different lane? Um, no, well, I guess like, those are both really different experiences, you know, but both of them were kind of building off of each other and coming out of the last against me record, even where, you know, the last against me record was a record that took like three months of tracking and however long of mixing. And it was really slow and arduous. And I've craved more and more immediate experiences of just like, I just want to learn the songs, know them well, go into the studio, press record, get in, get out, like, and that's it. Um, and so they were kind of building from there where like Batarat was recorded seven days and then um, Stay Alive was recorded in two days, mixed in another two days. Um, and, and again, you know, but Stay Alive was really more about working within the confines of like, well, this is the situation. It wasn't what you asked for. You know, like I had intended to make a record with the band. Can't make a record with the band. It's not about wanting to make a record with the band. I can make a record if I work here in Chicago. There's a studio right down the street with a world class recording engineer. Fucking Steve Albini is like a mile away from me right now, just sitting in a room working on records. And all I got to do is call him and I can go in and record where the Pixies have recorded, where PJ Harvey has recorded, where Nirvana has recorded. So like to be in that situation, it's like, why am I sitting here on my couch in my living room instead of doing that? Um, but then, you know, Batarat was like a totally different situation. but. But both of those records were definitely coming out of doing a lot of traveling, you know, like specifically Stay Alive. I wrote like at least half of that record while on that last tour of the UK and Europe um, that we did with Frank Iero and, and with Mobina Galore, which I'm thankful was like one of the best tours ever. Um, I'm thankful to have those memories. Yeah, I missed you on that tour. That's why it's been so long since we saw each other. I think I was on a tour at the same time and I'm because Frank's a friend as well. And I was really excited about seeing you both. But yeah, I can, you can feel it and hear it in the music. And as I said, that's why it made me think of Wes Anderson in that way. Like these are the kind of songs I could imagine appearing on the soundtrack to one of his films. There's a, a naivety to them. Uh, there's a tenderness. There's a playfulness. As I said, there's this kind of internationalness about them as well. And I'd never thought about it in that way, but it's about, above all else, the emotion that it inspires and instills. And it does. They really exude that all of those songs the emotions are different of course and the sense of feeling that you get with each one is is different but there's there's emotion and feeling there in in all of them um in in their different shapes and forms undeniably well you're trying you know like you ever see those videos of where uh they'll go into like a nursing home um where there's someone very elderly and like maybe they're in a state of dementia but they start playing music to them and instantly all these memories come back and they spark up like that's real you know and so oftentimes with writing a song you know i'm trying to capture specifically the way it felt for me in that moment to be there you know like there's that one song on the on stay alive called the ice cream song and first the first verse of it i wrote 
after a morning in Canberra, Australia. Woke up by myself, went for a run along the shore there. Um, and, you know, like came back, had a shower, drank a long black. Like it was just a perfect morning. And there was like birds on the lawn and like the sky looked a certain way. So trying to capture that so that anytime I hear that song, I can instantly recall it. And then the second verse was written while on tour there in the UK. And like a day I went and spent just hanging out in Brompton Cemetery. And it was beautiful. And I don't know if you've ever been to that cemetery, but it's incredible. Um, so just again, trying to capture that feeling. So if I, when you hear that song or you play it, you're instantly back in those moments. Um, I really appreciate at times like now specific, specifically, you know. With the approach to creating something like that, is it a mixture of magic and the unexplainable and then hard work and, and graft? Is it more or less of one of those things? Like when you look at, so you're going to write a song, are you trying to bottle the magic and do you think that it's more of a kind of unexplainable process of alchemy? Or is it really just hard work and working it out until you've got, you know, what you would consider a strong product at the end of the session? Well, the alchemy is what we were originally talking about in is what you realize when you have it together and you get a distance from it and you realize what the parts are and you weren't consciously building it. You know, you, you put together this book that was a collection of interviews and you didn't know that's what you were doing when you were starting out necessarily doing the interviews. And then you look at it and the alchemy of it is that book. The magic of it is that a song is magic, literally in that it's like a, a trance, you know, it's it's something that you're saying over and over and over and over and over again, and you're repeating it daily and every morning and, and you're doing that and that's a practice and that's repetition. And so it's like a prayer and prayers are magic, you know, and so that that's the alchemy and the magic of it for sure. I love it. It's been so nice catching up with you. Right on, Matt. A long time coming. I'm trying to think if there's any more things I wanted to ask you. Here we go. Just a huge one to end on. Um, spirituality and creativity and the link between the two. Do you think there is a strong link between the two? Would you consider yourself a spiritual human being? Are you on a quest in life and indeed your art to explore that side of the human experience? Uh, I know that is a very big multi-layered question, especially as we are, as I hinted at, approaching the end. But I want to get there before we say bye. Um, where do you stand on your relationship, I guess, between the material and the spiritual worlds, Laura? Well, I guess that, um, I guess it's best to say, like, I acknowledge that I oftentimes feel like that's something missing from my life or that I wish I had more of a connection with in that I feel like so disconnected from most of the options out there when it would come to like i'm not a christian you know like i don't like re organized religions i don't like belonging to groups like uh but that at the same but then again at the same time like you know i do feel things spiritually and i do search for connection on that level and i do try to understand things and i do seek like deeper understanding but i just don't have it all figured out um but but uh I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Oh, does that answer? <laughs> do Do you feel, um, do you feel happy now in your life? Like, are you in not just a good place, but do you feel like you're in the best place of your life at this stage? Because you seem very. I don't know. It's hard to get a read on someone over Zoom, and sure. it's not the same as being in a room together. I know. I know. If we were in the same room together, this would have been probably a different chat and you know, more profound, definitely. But I get a sense from looking at you and vibing off you and just seeing you that you seem like glowing and at, at peace, even well, though there's a pandemic still going on and things could be better. I'm talking about just in here because you can't control what's out there. Inside, are you good? Well, again, you know, like I have my good days. I have my bad days. I don't know realistically how anyone is supposed to totally feel right now. And I think it's unreasonable to expect anyone to feel like totally stoked considering the situations, you know, and, and talking about what we were talking about with like drinking and stuff for me in my head, you know, I think I set these goals in my head of like, well, well once I've released, you know, these two or three type of albums that I want to release and I'm at this age and you know, I'm in this kind of living situation and I don't have to worry about these things. 
then I can let my guard down and I can go ahead and I can, you know, drink wine all day and I can just hang out and smoke cigarettes and it won't matter anymore. And that'll be the rest of my life. I'll retire. You know, I'm not there. So I feel like I'm at this point where I realize like there's so much work ahead of me and it's going to take so much strength. And I don't know if I have it in me, but God damn it, I'm going to try, you know? Um, and, and so it's like that realistic standpoint right now, because we're all in this weird bardo too of like, you're waiting, you know, like you can't go forward yet. You can keep, keep doing that introspection. Keep looking at yourself under the microscope. It's only been a year of that shit. Keep doing it, you know, but, and eventually I think we're going to be able to go again, but not yet. So I don't know. That's where I'm at. Yeah. And you can only train so much, right? And that's, it has been a period of that, but we won't know the true effects and we can't really put into practice what we have learned until the world has reopened and we are you know existing in a kind of a free moving social world again because i might get outside when it is all open again and fuck it up <laughs> and all the lessons that i've learned might instantly come undone there's always that concern uh, isn't there yeah yeah you got to test it you know <laughs> uh laura i'm so i'm humbled by just the, the the relationship that we have i always enjoy connecting with you and i'm grateful for just having you in my life in the way that you are and it's been a wonderful catch up and i have nothing but as you hopefully know at this stage love and respect for you and uh thank you for for being you my pleasure matt the feeling is very mutual and i hope to see you in person soon it's gonna happen zoom's <laughs> dead it's over <laughs> And uh, yeah, you made me realize something then just talking about the book. Like I obviously never did all of these conversations with the view of putting them into chapters and things like that. And then, but they, they seemingly worked in that way. And there is that thing, isn't there? If you don't quite know at the time how it's going to turn out, but then it, it seems like the dots do all fit together. Um, I don't know why that was. But. Yeah. Well, but then you have these moments of like, you know, when you're in it, when you're working on that interview and you don't know you're working for the bigger, bigger thing, maybe like there was moments where you were like, I don't know if I need to work as hard on this or I won't put as much into it. And you would have let yourself down if you didn't, because then add it up, it creates this bigger thing. And that's when you realize, oh, there's these moments where maybe seemingly it doesn't matter what I'm doing right now, but added together with other things, it can create something greater. You know, we did all right, right? Agreed. <laughs> Don't be a stranger, Laura. All right, Matt. Take care of yourself. Okay. Have a wonderful day. See you soon. Yep. Bye. Bye. -bye.